Hey everybody, we are so excited to be bringing you another season of the Center for Sport and Social Justice's Making Moves podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Bonchasumi. Alongside student rep, Maddie Acosta, we're gonna be bringing you some amazing conversations in the upcoming week, so stay tuned. Hello everyone, this is your student co-host, Maddie Acosta, and I'm your CSSJ student rep and a senior here at CSU East Bay. I'll be graduating with a BA in kinesiology this semester. One of the great keystones of our curriculum for kinesiology is social justice in sport and health profession. I have been taught the complexities, realities, and ways to address social justice in the field of kinesiology, and I'm excited to be here and ready to learn. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our host, Lisa Bonta Sumi. Lisa is a licensed clinical social worker and practicing psychotherapist with over 20 years of clinical experience. She also brings her education and training as a mental performance consultant to her work with athletes, coaches, and teams. Lisa is the first mental performance coach at the Oakland Roots Soccer Club. As a response to need, Lisa built AF Mindset, a diverse team of athlete-centered clinicians and practitioners that spans over several states and into Mexico. Lisa is the host of the Athlete Mindset Podcast, a TEDx speaker, presenter, and a published author. We also have two expert guests today with us to discuss the complexities of refereeing in youth sports, Mike Watala and Caroline Sudeiko. Mike resides in Oakland, California, and is the executive editor of Soccer America, which was founded in 1971, and is the USA's oldest soccer publication Mike is also a U.S. licensed referee, began officiating as a young teenager, and has written extensively about soccer officiating. He has also written freelance articles about soccer for more than 30 media outlets in nine nations, including British magazines When Saturday Comes and World Soccer, as well as Germany's Kicker. We also have with us today Caroline Sudeiko, known to many as Coach Sudeiko. Caroline is a sports relationship coach for Coaching Capua Sports Consultants, LLC, aiming to facilitate wellness-based professional training to high-level education sports professionals, practitioners, and athletic department personnel. Coach Sudeiko has done it all when it comes to sports, both on and off the court, as a referee, as an athlete, as well as educating those who work with athletes. It's great to have everyone here. Now let's dive right on in. Thanks, Maddie. That was amazing. I was like, what? Who am I sitting with right now? Like, these are some amazing people. You did an awesome job. You know, what an introduction. I'm ready to definitely dive in. There's so much expertise here with Mike and Carolyn. I'm wondering, we'll start with Mike. What brought you to youth sports refereeing to begin with? In the beginning, it was the same as a lot of referees. Uh, Uh It was to make some extra money when you're a teenager. Right. I was there. I remember those days. Yes. And if you look at the top referees in soccer, especially in the United States, that's how they began. You know, uh-huh. and so who became famous for being the first American uh, referee of World Cup last summer in Australia with the Women's World Cup, her colleagues on the field as well. That that's how they started. You know, it's a fantastic thing to do when you're a kid because you're around a sport that you love and uh-huh. you're making some cash. Of course, it's not easy, and I don't think that many of us keep doing it. But for me, I was lucky enough to have the sort of mentors or support, whether it was my dad rep and, and the confidence, I think, to do it. So I enjoyed it. Love that. Thanks for sharing. Carolyn, was it the same for you or was it a little bit different? It was a little different, actually, okay. for me. I came into sports officiating already as a single parent of mm-hmm. a preteen. And I had returned to college as an adult, an older adult in my 30s. And so I was gigging it before gigging was a thing. (laughs) I I was refereeing. I was a part-time athletic director at an elementary school. I was working as a waitress in a Hawaiian restaurant. So I was doing whatever it took to support me and my son and my family. So sports has always been and officiating a very big part of of that way to provide for my family. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I mean, the question was, how did you start refereeing and what brought you here? But I guess the next question only makes sense. What keeps you here? Oh, I'm going to throw in a story of like how I actually began officiating. Yes, please. Uh, (laughs) It was 
1999, perhaps. And I went to the NorCal State Basketball Championships at the Kaiser Center in Oakland. And I went with a boyfriend of mine at the time who was also a referee. And I went with him and I saw Mazetta Garrett, Mm. Pac-12 official and local Bay Area female official. And she was wearing the brightest red lipstick I ever saw on the court. And I said to my boyfriend at the time, who is that? And I want to do that. It was modeled for me. I was already a basketball coach, but I saw her demeanor. I saw the respect that she commanded. I saw that she was in this space that she was just in command of. And I wanted that for myself. And I knew I could do it. And right after I had inquired about it, my boyfriend at the time said, you can't do that. That's my world. And that was the first time any man had told me that I couldn't do anything. (laughs) And so, you know, I'm just going to say, like, don't let me be there when that was being said. Like, I'm just so glad I wasn't. But I know you handled it, Carolyn. Well, yeah, we we didn't last that much (laughs) after that. But, I mean, we're still good friends now. But I did start my training. I had asked folks to help me. And I was given really good advice. I attached myself to a couple of very good associations in the Bay Area. And ones that I know were aligned with my goals. And I had made a goal to be a high school championship official in five years. And I did that. and. That was one of a number of instances where I know that sports and especially refereeing in this pathway was really tangible and it could be transmitted to others if that was in alignment with their goals. So I went into it as, like Mike said, just needing, you know, needing money, needing to have a part time job and enjoying sports. And I what I got out of it was so much more rewarding and really it helped me self-actualize in so many different ways that was healthy in terms of power, in terms of my relationship with adversity, my relationship, all all the positive things that we say sports contributes to. Right, right. Personal growth, but through this this Uh pathway of adjudicating games. It was great. And I think that that is the sort of lesson that I want to transmit to others, that if that is a way. It doesn't have to be always through sports participation, but or the participation in this way, right? You don't have to be just the athlete pathway. There's sure. so many different ways. For sure. No, I really appreciate you. Thank you for sharing such a personal and intimate story. I mean, I think a couple of things stand out for me in that role models matter. It's so important to see other women in spaces that we want to occupy and see them doing it especially in an underrepresented field for women. Representation is key. And I think setting goals around how you want to show up and what it means to you to be in this field. And I think that's important for any field. But the extension of yourself as an athlete into being able to express yourself in another role, but still be so connected to sports and actually help you with your self-image and your self-esteem and confidence is huge. So I really appreciate that. I did have to give up my dream of being able to dunk a basketball, but I stopped going when I was four nine. <laughs> all good, all good, not the end all be all. But Mike, how about for you? I mean, we all start something, especially in this situation. We start it for a reason. What keeps you in it? What keeps you in the fold this way? Yeah, I had refereed for a while out of college, and then when my daughter was, I, I did a lot of coaching, and then when my, when my daughter turned thirteen or fourteen. I convinced her to get her referee's license. So I went through it again and kept doing it. You know, a little bit of that, I think, was remembering the experience that I had with my father and also how valuable I thought being a referee was. I mean, one thing about sports, which I think is something that I'm sure we'll get to, is that it does a lot of good things for people as far as the emotional roller coaster you go through, the being maybe very disappointed or upset, but having to like readjust that within a split second. In other words, that requires teammates cooperating, things like that. But it can also bring out the worst of people as far as when those emotions aren't handled or when it become normalized that 
you can criticize referees, uh, abuse referees. I kept refereeing consistently almost every weekend for the last 20 years. Part of it was it was great for story ideas. Part of it I felt as a as a besides coaching, especially refereeing, to be a soccer journalist, it's good to be in the game as well. But what really struck me was being so close to the kids and seeing their reactions to getting yelled at by the coaches, getting yelled at by parents. I could see how I had the perfect view of the people who were yelling at me. You could see these kids' faces, how they lost their confidence and got discouraged by having these adults yell at them, right? So that's one issue that happens in the, at the sports, at the youth level that I, that I just don't, I don't understand why it happens. I mean, I understand why it happens, but for people to yell at, for adults to yell at children while they're playing to me is completely atrocious. And then when you have it happen to referees, it's just that modeling type of behavior that I think is probably, in my opinion, the biggest challenge referees like we have at the grassroots level is because it's normalized at the very highest level. And so it's like it's saying it's okay to do that. When like a 10 or 11 or 12 year old kid yells at you, and you're like, you know, I'm, like my, I'm an adult. I mean, what are you, it's probably the only time in their lives, I guess, where they can get away with just like screaming at an adult. And I, I mean, and then when you talk about teenage boys, you know, that's just completely. Well, my uh, the only the thing here, too, is I don't mean to interrupt, is that yeah. I bet there's never been a conversation. I think there should be with parents and their young athletes about how to respect the referee. I don't think that's a conversation because they see their peers doing it. So then it's OK, like you said, to normalize. But I think yeah. there needs to be adults coming in and saying what's a respectful environment. How do we create that for ourselves and for everybody involved, including the referees? Right. But I think that's an interesting conversation. Well, if you look at the most serious examples of refereeing abuse just this last year, you had an off-duty police sergeant in Florida knock a whistle out of a referee's mouth. We had an incident in the Bay Area where a 14, 15-year-old girl was basically yelled at so much by this coach that she was in tears. I have so much admiration for her because she kept refereeing. I got to referee with her. I actually made sure I picked the game so I could meet her and, and I wanted to talk to her about it a little bit. And she was tearing up even then. And I did some research on what happened to this person. Who was this person? He was a professor. We're talking about a professor. We're talking about a police officer. We're talking about people who we hope in other parts of their lives would know better than that or not model that. So it's a really big issue and it escalates into situations that are not only create the ref shortage, but in some cases, you know, lead to violence. Right. On many levels. I think before we get to the solutions, because I think that's a very important part because we all kind of have our own experiences with refs. I mean, like even, you know, at the Roots Games, the sort of supervision and oversight and protection, I might add, of the referees, you know, coming out of the locker room to the field and then leaving the field into the locker room and into the parking lot, depending on the outcome of the game, how it goes. But I guess, given all that, Mike, though, what keeps you in it? Well, the highest level I referee are under 19 boys. And I do that because I do that as a volunteer for Soccer Without Borders because they don't have uh, parents to referee. Otherwise, I actually try to make it relatively easy for myself. Now, when I referee those games, we do it at Oakland Tech, and there's very few adults in the stands. And I'm not exaggerating. When It's about at least five times easier. It's not easy to referee two 19 boys. You know, physically, athletically, they're fantastic and everything. And teenage boys can go from being decent human beings to just the biggest knuckleheads in like a split second. <laughs> it's just like mind boggling. <laughs> I think we now, right. I, think, I think there's some science now why we understand that my side, you know, <laughs> our gender, you know, has some issues with, uh, you know, those type of behavior reactions. But I must say, I do enjoy it. And I, it's like any profession, I think that you, keep trying to improve and trying to figure out how to how to de-escalate something, how to try and keep things under control. And it's a tricky one, though, because you can't, you know, when it comes to refereeing, somebody can have someone. I remember this kid that I got to be pretty close with during it was, yeah, it's one of these, every once in a while you make connections with players and stuff. And I hadn't seen him for about a year or so because of COVID, because then we kind of got into pods and all that, right? So I finally see him and, you know, he's, you could tell he's, happy to see me, which doesn't happen much for teenage boys. You know, I coach girls and boys. Boys, with girls, you can kind of tell they like you. I'm generalizing. I apologize for that. For sure. No, it's true. But you can tell if they kind of like you, right? And they read right. your body language. Boys, it's just like, you have no idea. 
And if they but, like you, they try to hide it. They exactly. don't try, right? Yeah. They try to like. Uh, but I could, I could see it in his eyes. And if it wasn't uh-huh. for COVID, I'm sure he would have, we would have hugged, right? Like, and so I'm refereeing his game. And then about five minutes in, there's a handball that I don't call when he kicked the ball on the player's arm, and it was an unintentional handball. And he swore at me like, you know, he swore at me like I was his enemy forever. It just took like, you know, the, the emotions that happen in sports are something that, like I said, are a good thing and also like things that can get out of control. For sure. I'm going to start with Carolyn and come back to Mike. So I, I really appreciate, I mean, I want to go back and say too how I heard you say, Mike, that you stay in it because it's like an intergenerational tradition almost. Your father, you, your daughter. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really special. I think although you are saying, I and mean, people can't see you, but you are saying these are the the abuses and the sort of yelling and screaming and all that. Like, I can tell that you're very passionate about it and that there's a responsibility that you have to the up and coming kids and youth and referees to be able to be a good role model and to be able to keep this profession alive because you have to have a deep purpose, in my opinion. And I'm sure you would agree to stay in it with all of that going on and to remember what that purpose is and the reason why you're doing it. But with that said, I'll go to Carolyn and then Mike next. How do you manage your own emotions, you know, in the moment, in the games, and then maybe even before as you prep and then after as you debrief? How do you take care of your own emotions as you do this very important job? This is a wonderful question because what I'm going to bring to this question is a response that comes from, I think, my immigrant sort of survival Uh sort of context, Uh I think, Uh where I'm already trying to fit in, right? And sports is that socialization tool. As an immigrant, I came here to the States as a toddler, and I used sports as a socialization tool. I realized that I could I could hit a ball really hard. I was athletic and I used that to make friends, to build friend groups. And so I already knew my power in that. I think with sports officiating, it was what I was really trying to search for was this this idea of an American context, of a socialized context Mm. that drew my parents to come here right? Whether that's the American dream or whether that's opportunity or something like that, whatever those altruistic sort of shiny things that attract people Mm -hmm. to come here. That's what I was trying to find. I think that's what I was trying to search for. And I loved it that it was in sports where I knew if I knew that rule book, I knew the rule book back and forth. I knew how to improve myself. I got good advice and I listened to very good people about how to be trained in this profession. I knew the landscape politically and I knew the landscape socially, what it meant for me to be a basketball official in a context that was that is still, I would say, patriarchal, that is still very elitist, that is mm-hmm. still, yeah, that's has all those characteristics of institutionalized context in our society. I was understanding that and I was still in sports. And that's what that's what I loved about it. Like sports is, is still that fun sort of microcosm of that. And so when I knew that officiating would reward me in those ways that I could feel liberated, that I could be in this context with young people, with coaches, in this scenario that where everyone's trying to strive and do their best, me included, right? Me included. And I was working with people who wanted to be in service of the game. Uh uh That's what kept me in. When I knew that I couldn't be as adherent to that anymore, whether that's, you know, I wasn't physically up to it, I wasn't trained or I didn't have the heart for it, I knew that I would be doing sports a disservice, right? And so how do I redirect that? And I found that redirecting it through that transmission, right? Trying to keep coaches and officials, especially women, women of color, trained well and keeping them retained in this very difficult profession because it's still an avocation. For most of us, it's still not our main source of revenue, Right. So there has to be something else. And these days, that's 
too much of a of a burden for people because they have families, because they have other responsibilities, right. because we have other forces that are pulling at us. And so I still feel that it's very, it's almost like luxurious. When I was able to like leave my school and travel two hours to a game and spend time with wonderful people and examining the game and talking about sports and then, you know, spending an evening over. Well, let me ask you this, because for people who don't know, yes. you and I are from the same country. My mother is from the Philippines. I'm an immigrant. I came here when I was a toddler as well. My dad's a white American. And so you and I both know, and maybe other people for different reasons know that emotions and having emotions and handling emotions are not mm -hmm. something that's talked about in a lot of right. different cultures and a lot of different people's origins. And so with refereeing and basketball, in your case, being small quarters, everybody's on top of each other, it seems like, and feels like it's a very intense environment. At least with soccer, you're spread out. It's outside. There's a little bit more room and space. You can run away from things a little bit, <laughs> for lack of a better way of describing it. But we don't lead with emotions in our culture. It's a luxury to have emotions and to talk about them. So with that, how did you learn, I'm going to jump to Mike, to manage your own emotions as they percolate yeah. throughout a game, as you manage someone else's emotions, deal with a kid coming at you because of a call or a parent coming at you because of a call. How do you, for those out there listening who might get a tip or two or a gem from you about your experience, who referee out there, what can you bestow on us about the ups and downs of learning about that for yourself? And how do you address it now? Yeah, that's probably one of the hardest things for me because I don't necessarily have a thick skin when it comes to being criticized as I'm refing, you know, because I see myself as someone who knows the rules inside out. You know, one thing I, I do want to go back to real quick is that I do have fun most of the time. And you get the exercise. It's fantastic yes. being around. You see a goal from a Bengali when it's here. Yeah. And I'm also lucky enough that and I do this as coaching too, because of my journalism job, I will interview the best coaches in the country, sometimes the world, and referees. And I'll ask them those kind of questions. And I really do admire referees, how unbelievably focused they can be and composed. And I found that my strategy, and again, I try and keep getting better and better at it, but to be friendly at the before the game, you know, to try and maybe be the humorous as possible or to try and like say, okay, here, I'm this guy. And then I would tell him right away, you guys watch soccer, right? You ever see a soccer game where they didn't have a controversy about the refereeing? And it's my opinion, more or less, I'm pretty sure this is about right. But every game at every level from the World Cup to the English Premier League, you're usually going to have about two or three calls that are either wrong or questionable. And now they have video review. And right. if you follow soccer, they still have controversies on Monday and Tuesday. And that's using professional referees and video review. And so I see somebody yell at a 14-year-old kid. I go, okay, so you expect it to be perfect somehow today? I asked a referee once. I go, is it okay to say, to apologize for a call? And he said, yeah, I do. don't do it more than once a half. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, you know, I will tell, I'll say to the kid, I go, I didn't see that. I go, there were three players between me and the ball. I didn't see it. I'll look out for it, but, you know, you can't call what you can't see. That sort of discipline, that self-discipline that you have to have not to get angry back. Right. Which, which is could be very hard for me when I get parents yelling at you. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm talking about nine-year-olds. Like on Sunday, I try to do little kids. And it's fun, too, because I can see kids from different parts of the Bay Area. Like I love doing Oakland Soccer Club kids who are like nine or ten because of how skillful they are because they come from a soccer culture where they play by play on their own. And it's terrific. Right. And it's the same with the girls more and more. And so you can be doing games and there's a adult yelling at you in front of their kids and you're going, I just want to stop the game and go, you've got to be kidding me, right? Like it's <laughs> 8 a.m. in the morning, right? I came out of here at 8 a.m. in the morning and right. you're yelling at me and you're not supposed to do, obviously interact with the parents. You're supposed to go over to the coach and tell the coach, you know, you got to deal with your parents. But that process of trying to handle that situation properly is fun in a way. I mean, fun in the kind of way of anything we do, that's a challenge that we're trying to get uh -huh. better at. And I watch obviously a lot of sports to see how they handle it. I wish I had a good piece of advice I could I could give, but you stay focused on what you're doing and 
And that part is not as hard as it sounds because you have no choice, right? But that's one of the actually really fun things about refing or interesting things about refing is let's say it's, you know, a 90 minute game or for that entire time, you have to be completely focused on that. You can't think about, oh, right. you know, for lunch afterwards. Right. And that's kind of a neat thing too. I mean, I've never tried meditating. I, I should, probably should because never pulled it off for more than a minute, which probably means I should do it. But it's that same sort of thing where you're not thinking about anything else in your life except this game. And I think that's kind of one of the attractive thing about refereeing as well. No, for sure. I mean, what you're talking about, and don't talk to me about like meditation and breathing and like being in the moment as a mental performance coach. But I mean, I think what you're telling me is that your experience of refereeing is a mindful one. You're in the moment. You're here. I mean, your safety and the safety of others depends on it. Psychological safety, physical safety. You don't want to be thinking about lunch and you're going to run and like trip in a hole and then hurt yourself and then not be able to do your thing. But like, you got to be there and like scanning and like, there's a lot of things going on. If I could throw in one, I just thought of this as far as being a more specific piece of advice is I've done this where I've, you know, gotten pretty angry at how I'm being treated or whatever the situation is in the game and my heart's fluttering and right. And I will walk over to the assistant referee, which this is a completely legitimate thing to do. And sometimes it's a 14 year old kid. Sometimes it's another adult. And I'll say, hey, Sally. I'm just talking to you right now because I need to take a deep breath and calm down because right now I'm ready to, you know, and just do that and take a deep breath and stuff. So that would be my, it's like, if you have a chance, if you really do need to kind of like calm down a little bit, you stop the game. The other one I did once, <laughs> these parents were yelling like out of control and I stopped the game. It was like a throw in and I looked, I scanned the crowd and I just started scribbling in my notebook while I was looking at them. <laughs> Not allowed to talk to them or anything, but I thought, you know, maybe that'll give them a second to think about what they've been doing. Those are amazing tips. I mean, Carolyn, I'm going to get to you in a sec because there's so much more to talk about here. But just to summarize real quick so yeah. people can hear what Mike's talking about is that as a referee, you have a team behind you that you can lean on for support, that you're not out there by yourself, whether you are head ref or assistant ref or whatever sport you know you're in that you have other people and i love that i love too that like scribbling in a notebook that's actually you know in my opinion a form of journaling or like getting your thoughts out of your head into paper whatever form you have you know you have your little referees notebook that's a tool that you have and can be used i think it's amazing that you can think of that i want all the young referees to think of those opportunities and i will add you don't need to like Go to your assistant referees to take that breath. If you can, cool. You can do it in the moment. You can do it while you're walking. No one has to know. Like an intentional, and then I'm going to keep going. Like yeah. it can be just as that, right? But I love the combination of that with your assistant referee. But Carolyn, I know you're jumping at the bit. Ooh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. What I, do you have to add to this well, I'm conversation? Gonna, I'm going to riff off that, Mike, because Let's go. I think what I'm seeing in this is going into the critique, perhaps, of what are the challenges of, uh -huh. of our current context is that when I was refereeing all those years ago, that sort of training was afforded to me and my colleagues. We had training sessions on how to develop those interpersonal connections with each other, uh -huh. how to develop our team of referees, how to go to a game together, how to do a summary report together, how to be a team as we go to, to awesome. assignments, right? And I think what's happening now with the crisis and the lack of capacity in officials' programs and the lack of training because of the lack of capacity for people to do this is that that part's not taken care of anymore, right? Hmm. Where when I was a beginning official, I was not just assigned a mentor, but I got to choose. Oh, wow. I got to choose who I could work with, who I would work with. And then the leaders of the association made sure that we were on games together. So I was mentored by people who, who had that vision to take the time to mentor, right? Mm -hmm. So I was working with really high quality officials and that's why I was able to advance really quickly. And the fact that I was also driven but I was driven in alignment with the training programs that I, I associated with, uh, high-quality programs, which I think are kind of lacking now. 
it's hard for and now associations in California, in California, just the high school associations in California, there are over 150 sports officials associations. If I wanted to learn how to officiate, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like people say, call your local association. And I would be like, well, where do I find that information? And it's cumbersome to find that. And that's because California is so big. In other states, they have one association that does all the sports assigning, right? But in California, it's cumbersome, it's confusing. And so these institutions create a high barrier for accessibility into this place. And so th- that's where I'd like to see some, uh-huh. some change and then some fortification of that training program. Because what I see in the future, if I could, if y'all could just indulge me here for a minute, really, like you said, Mike, that there's already replay, there's already technology and video that are also adjudicating these games. We're going to get to the point where I think the future of officiating is going to be in robotics, in technology, in these technological advances where you don't need a human person to adjudicate the games. And I think what that can do for us is that might help us to bring back this human-centered way yeah. of doing sports right if we could leave the are you out of bounds are you not out of bounds are you following by the letter of the rule if we could leave that to technology and then we can really bring the spirit of sports into it like all these positive self-development and self-actualization uh-huh. pathways of sports then i think the role of of the referee will be enhanced the role of sports We'll move in a better direction. So that's what I see in the future. I think right now it's hard uh-huh. because we still are dependent on systems that aren't useful anymore. Uh-huh. Because when my 13-year-old son decides to play organized sports for the first time as 13 years old, he's already behind, right? He's already going to get cut from right. every team, right? And yet I need for him to be able to access organizations and sports programs that will love on him for as awkward as he is, Mm -hmm. who will also offer that modeling of what sports can do. I need for sports programs to exist for girls and girls of color Uh because they are the ones that are quitting sports at higher rates and at earlier ages. So I need for these non-elitist programs to exist. And I need folks right now to officiate those games for my son and yes and his crew, you know, who for sure who like sports, but they're not gonna play at elite levels. Well you're talking about the heart and soul of what social justice is in sports. Exactly. That's what you're talking about right now and what our center is about and the messages we're trying to deliver to everyone. This podcast here is something that's going to be free and accessible to anyone to riff off of on their own right, to kind of think about what Mike and Carolyn are talking about and kind of see how they can apply it to their communities, their schools, their youth groups. Because let's be serious, youth players who play, they don't grow up saying, oh, after I finish my sport, I want to be a referee. That's not what they say. Not a lot of... I said it one time. (laughs) Or like if there's an intergenerational tradition or there's some example of it being positive. Because... That everyday usual athlete is going to be like, oh, I want to be a coach or a trainer or strength and conditioning coach or heaven forbid, maybe a sports psychologist. But like, it's rare in my world that it's a referee unless there's good role modeling and good skill development for them to be able to regulate their own emotions as well, which in my work, I believe referees, officials are high performers. And so in that high performing environment, in the stressful moments, they need to know how to do that. Decrease their heart rate, center back, take care of business. And we don't talk about it enough. But Mike, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about what you think some of the potential solutions might be to keep this profession going for that everyone is safe, treated with respect. Carolyn talked about mentors, the strength of professional organizations and associations the modeling that our young athletes need in these adults who are there with us on the court, on the field. What do you see would be, if you could like wave a magic wand, what would be a couple of things that you would like to see? Well, 
the mentor example is very important. And I think that mm-hmm. in soccer now they're calling them ref coaches. And mm-hmm. in a recent article I did, they were saying that because of the rest shortage at the grassroots, and talking to teenagers and volunteer parents or whatever, because of that shortage, the referees who would be the ref coaches are picking up the games themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that creates that shortage. If I had a magic wand, it would start with changing the way soccer does its rules. So you mentioned that other sports having a bunch of different associations. The way that soccer works is FIFA is the world governing body. They have more members than the UN does, but you have to do what they do. And the people who create the rules or ignore the rules is a group called IFAB that works under FIFA. They are so slow to take action. And the action that they promised for 20 years and have yet to do anything about it is the mobbing of referees, the mass confrontation of referees that I will see that in almost every game. And that's the first thing I would stop because that is such normalizing of such obnoxious behavior. You know, American sports have a lot of smart things going for them. You know, one is that after every season, they get together and reassess, you know, are too many quarterbacks getting injured, you know, or is baseball too slow? Is that happening? Are there too many of this kind of injuries? And then they come up to a solution. Okay, well, we need to change that rule. We need to tweak that rule. We have to, you know, support our referees. The soccer has something in its rules that is very specific, and that is that right dissent by word and action is a caution, a yellow card. Next time you watch soccer games, see how many times that card isn't shown for dissent. And the reason it isn't is because those refs don't get the support. If they did, they would say, oh, he's giving too many cards. You know, there used to be, it used to hear this thing. I don't know if you still hear it a lot, but it used to really bother me. They said, oh, the best referees are the kind that you don't notice. <laughs> the referee can have an influence perhaps on keeping a game under control, but it's not the referee who's breaking the rules, who's trying to get away with everything he possibly have. If a referee has to be noticed because they're cracking down on something, that referees, they're doing their job. It's hard for me to sort of say exactly whether things have gotten better or for worse when it comes to sideline behavior. Uh, I've seen a lot of progress. The clubs that have the resources can dedicate them to educating parents. And you can do things like have a monitor who, you know, who enforces the rules about or or the guidelines on not yelling at refs and things like that. The smaller clubs, especially underserved neighborhoods, they don't have any, they don't have most clubs in the United States, these elite clubs have paid coaches. If they're a little bit bigger, they might have the paid technical directors, sometimes even paid administrators. The clubs in the underserved communities or even just regular communities that don't happen to be part of this big soccer you know, fight industrial complex, they don't have the resources necessarily to monitor their parents and to educate their parents. And so the reason I said I'm not sure if it's gotten worse or better is because you can sense it's gotten worse by if you hear about the bad incidents and anecdotally and anything. And I do believe that my grandmother used to say this in German, but the, the fish rots from the head down is we live in a country right now where the, the former president, the person running for president has completely normalized being an absolutely rude, uh, bad mannered, hateful person. Right. And It's hard for me to not to believe that that has an influence when that kind of thing is normalized by the people who are supposed to keep their composure and act like decent human beings. So I think there's a lot of factors and that needs to be addressed from the grassroots and then from the top down. And obviously sports can't solve the problem of the person I just mentioned, but they can certainly realize they have a responsibility to the society, to their sport to not allow that kind of misbehavior. You know, I mean, but it's like I don't watch ice hockey in the United States because they basically condone fist fighting, right? Oh. That's one thing you can say about soccer, that the, the player punches another player in soccer, then that player is going to be suspended for probably two or three months or more. In basketball, I rarely see these players go after refs the way they do in soccer. So they must know, you know, there's, there's solutions to control that. Hockey and rugby have only the captains allowed to talk to the referee if the referee allows it. That's a simple solution soccer could use. I think those are amazing solutions and things that, you know, we should take to the powers that be. I mean, I think you speak to the social justice inequities as well, Mike, about what resources some communities have and what they don't. So I think it's a parallel process. How our parents speak to the refs and how our parents speak to their own children and that education. You know, I was getting teased because I did this piece with The Roots recently and 
you know, one of the questions was, you know, what are the good things and not so good things going on with parents and youth sports? I said a bunch of things, but then I also said they need to just chill. And that kind of like took a life of its own in that situation. But I mean that in the way that we need to learn how to calm ourselves, how to do that, and how do we get that those skills and resources well, to the parents and in referees that don't have access to that kind of situation due to the socioeconomic barriers? Well, one thing I, I learned about myself as far as when I referee, and I figured out, <laughs> I don't know exactly when, but I have this trait where if I'm talking about something serious or if I have a, if I'm being serious, I can look like I'm angry. <laughs> and and I realized about I realized that about myself. You're like people, oh, what are you about? I'm not mad. I'm just like talking. And I realized, okay, that's just how my face works. <laughs> I have to remember that when I'm running around that field, not to look like I'm angry. And part of the reason I came to that, not that is that at Soccer Without Borders, the full-time coaches are tremendously trained and de-escalating. And uh-huh. it's unbelievable what I've seen them do in situations that are with high tempers. And I think it's because they're good people, but also because they were trained to do that. That should be, I mean, as a coach, every single game I've ever coached since I, you know, 40 years, the first thing I've always done is as soon as the final whistle blows, I've gone up to the referee and shake their hands and thank them. Uh You know, Uh no matter what happened in that game. And Uh part of the reason I, is because I want the parents and players to see that if the coach isn't mad at the ref, then Kind of weird that I am, right? That coach supposed to know, but just to kind of simply model that. But the other thing I've tried to do as a journalist is that sometimes I write about the fact that if you're a coach and you want to win, which coaches want to do, that's natural. Being a jerk to the referee is not going to help you. Like who gets it in their head that if you're really mean to somebody, that's going to somehow help you? And right. And the other part of it is that if you blame the referee, you've just basically let your players think that the reason they didn't do as well as they could today wasn't because they need to learn how to do something better or train, you know, train better or try and get better. It's the ref's fault, right? How is that possibly a good way to get the most out of your team if you give them a, a scapegoat? You know, it's pretty amateur sort of lame behavior, and it's pretty obvious that coaches are doing it. At the higher levels, they do it because they want to, they, maybe the owners will think, oh yeah, it wasn't these bad coaches. So at the lower levels, they do it. I mean, maybe all coaches do it, but a lot of these coaches make a living coaching kids and uh-huh. they're paid by the parents and they don't right. want the parents to think it's their fault. It's because of the crappy referee. Wow. You're talking about the business of sports and the business of how decisions are made, which I think we should talk about more. We could do a whole other episode on that and the influence that it has on family dynamics, communication, a player's performance, a player's well-being. Really, a family's well-being. You, know? you would have ref abuse, I think, even if soccer and other sports hadn't gotten to be such a big business. I think you would still have some because that's a, that's human nature. But it's a big part of it when parents are paying all that money, and when something becomes a business, the other parts of it get ramped up. For sure, and there's other motivations happening all around us. I mean, let's do that. Let's pin that. That would be a whole nother great conversation. I think right now, you know, it's been such a pleasure as I'm getting ready to pass to my co-host. I'm just wondering if there's any last few words that you'd like to leave the audience with, both Carolyn and Mike, about this topic of refereeing, solutions for refereeing, and keeping the profession alive and well. What would you like to add in closing here? I'd like to really implore, Mike talked about resources. Uh Right. And I'd like to really implore organizations that have resources to invest in training. Uh There are a lot of organizations that don't have the capacity or just to put it plainly, that don't have money to even pay me as a practitioner consultant to come in and support that training, whether that be the human connection, whether that be how to create a team atmosphere in a sports profession or how to create and live through a mentoring program that benefits everyone involved and that strengthens the organization. So I pitch often to organizations who tell me that they need this support and they don't have the funds, Mm -hmm. right? They don't have the funds. And so that's bearing 
now on programs. They're cutting programs. School districts don't have any money. Organizations and institutions are reliant on grants that are more broadly awarded instead of more locally awarded. Uh And so uh it's, Uh it is this sort of dynamic, right, that we find ourselves in that has all these layers that affect the retention and the training and the thriving of that part of athletics, right, where we can experience flow, right, where we can experience Uh teamwork, where we can experience all these wonderful benefits of being adjacent to our sports experience, right? So I, that's kind of like my call to action is that we need to look at how resources are shared. First of all, it's counter to our elitist sort of ideals of how sports is, but how those resources are shared equitably, how those resources are then in the service of the higher level of sport, which brings then the human component into it. How are we giving credit to the fact that the resource lies in the people, in the human beings that are the practitioners, Mm -hmm. right? So we can invest in technology. Like I said, let the robots do the adjudicating. Let the human beings teach about how to be a human being through sports. Yes. Yes. No, I love that. Thank you so much. So powerful and thoughtful. Thank you. Mike, how about you? At the grassroots level, I believe that an effective way to end referee abuse, to make refereeing a more comfortable situation for entry-level referees is through the coaches. Coaches should have to learn the rules. You know, they take all these licenses and do all this stuff. Rarely is there. They should be required. They don't have to take a big course, but they have to do the kind of thing you would do at the DMV, right? You've got to at least learn the rules and comprehend why you're there. It's about children playing. and. If you go to a a soccer field, you know, these complexes where there's five games going on, and I do this all the time, or when I ref, I look at the coaches, and all too frequently, the coaches don't look like they're having a good time. They have Um, negative body language, they're yelling at their players, they're walking back and forth. In my opinion, a coach should sit down and watch the game and coach a practice or at halftime. If there's a break in play, if that coach can civilly say something, then fine. But I come so close to asking a coach after a game, excuse me, I'm just curious, do you like sports? Or do, you like soccer? <laughs> do you like being around kids? Because your body language just mm. showed everybody that you're not mm. enjoying mm. this. Why, why mm. are you not here? So if you get coaches to understand that their body language should be about something positive and not to make a big deal about a handball call, I mean, you would not believe the kind of stuff people yell at you at, like a bad throw-in or something like that. Uh, I think that would be one way maybe specifically to, and that could be done because I know that millions and millions of dollars go into all kinds of X's and O's type of uh, coaching education. There should be some of it, you know, learning the rules and understanding that you should have. And it's good. The best coaches have, a lot of the best coaches in the world, like Jill Ellis, who's a wonderful coach who won two World Cups with with the U.S. You watch her on the sidelines and she looks like she's having a good time. She's calm. Her players look over, the game's going tough, they go, huh. Coach Phil doesn't seem to be upset. I guess she's confident in us, you know? Right. No, I love that. I think that's super important. Wow. This was, again, I think we could have talked for a whole other hour, two hours, three hours on this. Maybe a part two or three is in the works. We'll see. But Miss Maddie, I'm going to shoot it to you. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for being here and making time for this amazing conversation. Mike and Carolyn, you guys are truly leaders in this field. and you are setting a role model for the future generations of refereeing. So I thank you for all the work that you're doing now and the work you continue to do in the field. So thank you for sharing your expertise with us here today on the Making Moves podcast. Uh, We'll make sure to link and reference in the show notes for those who want to follow up with any action steps, as well as hear about the work that Mike and Carolyn are doing. Thank you so much. And we should get a lot of, go ahead, Mike, I cut you off. Oh, no, thank you so much. It's totally my pleasure. I see a dog in the back. (laughs) Sometimes he barks when he comes in. Oh oh my gosh. He's beautiful. Oh my gosh. The crayon. Anyway, we're getting off point. But no, this is the real humanity of this conversation, in my opinion. I think that, yes, Mr. Mike, Ms. Carolyn, thank you so much for all of your expertise, your representation. 
And Miss Maddie, thank you for co-hosting with me. You're doing an excellent job. I appreciate it. She does a lot of behind the scenes for us as well. Thank you so much, Maddie. Yeah, she's fantastic. And so, you know, we can't wait to get this out to the masses and have people engage with this content. So thank you again very, very much. 